Because that means that there's another God beside him. That means he's one of many. But we make this thing quite definitive. Buddha is dead. He ain't coming back again. Muhammad is bones and dust somewhere who didn't have the power to get back up again. Our lie is the fiction of someone's imagination. We have the privilege of serving the only true living all wise God. I don't hear anybody in this room. And if it costs my life, I'll declare this. My God. He's the awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. He doesn't have wisdom. He is wisdom. He don't have power. He is power. He is love. singing and I gotta sit down. The Bishop of Okushia Mahaya, I'm sorry. The doctor told me I couldn't do this. The cyst that was the size of a dime was grown to the size of a penny on my right vocal cord and this vocal cord is paralyzed to this day. Paralyzed. Don't vibrate, don't move. tell me that it's causing abrasion on the left vocal cord and that there's a callus and a cyst growing there. I feel shuffle. The pastor hides. He didn't give this to me for me to allow the enemy to snatch it away. If I ever sang again, it would be in bass register because the cyst hinders me, prohibits me from using any type of range. They told me that I would never sing like I used to sing again. And that I wouldn't be able to preach again. Now when they told me I couldn't sing again, they should have stopped there. Because I got real sad. But when they stepped over the boundary and let me hear the voice of Satan and his plan and purpose telling me that I could never preach again, then they made me mad. And the one thing you don't want to do is get a Christian mad. Because it shows, I'm telling you, you get us mad, the first thing we do is fall. And that's the worst position to find us in. Give me A flat, give me A flat. I'm going to sing and get out the way. But just because the devil said I couldn't do it. You got to make him eat his words. You got to make him eat his words. Just because the devil said I couldn't do it. Woo, it feels good to do this thing. I do it just to laugh in his face now. You should have killed me when you had the chance. But it's too late now. Because I know who I am. And I know the power that's inside. The great.
Nacional. Thanksgiving, right? So everybody giggling. I keep <laughs> saying Thanksgiving. But when you think about the 4th, the 4th of July is really Thanksgiving, if you think about it. Because that is Americans' independence. And what are we independent from? 
We got freedom from where? Anybody knows why you even have an independence? Yes, sir. We have our freedom from the rule of Britain. So don't you know it's so awesome when you get freed from something that's controlling you, that's your master and your overseer, and you finally have the right to say yes or no about your life. So I know a lot of people say 4th of July, and I do too, but it's a, it's a moment to be thankful for because without that freedom, we'd be in trouble right now, right? Many of us would be in trouble. You know, we, we, we did on the blog this week that we have a family in distress. We talked a little bit about hatred. And one of the things that I felt was very important that people need to understand is not just about hatred, but to know where you're going. You got to know where you're coming from. And many people don't know where hatred came from. And so you have a lot of talks about it's taught in the home. It's this, it's that. Actually, hatred started way back in biblical time. When Cain and Abel, and he slaughtered his brother just because he felt the brother was more popular in the sight of God. That was the first murder that we heard of. And then we saw other similarities throughout the course of history. In America, where hatred and slavery and the idea of a race, who can tell me who was on the blog, when did that first, the, the, the word race first appear in America? Because slavery was never about what it is. It was never about color. It was about indentured labor. There was no such thing as I'm going to make you a slave because you're black Chinese or otherwise. So when did the first concept come to America and why did it come to America? Anybody was on the blog. Lucy started trying to say, don't pick on me, don't pick on me. She know I'm going to pick on her, so I don't know why she tried to ignore it. <laughs> Do you remember? It's, if you don't, you don't. Well, she don't want me to put her on blast, she said. Well, it actually started in the New World. It was the Europeans who brought the idea of race. In the 1800s, they, they, when they started bringing people over, the Europeans were the ones who said, hey, we're going to take over this place. And the first act of race that they did was a genocide on Colombians. And they tried to eradicate that nation, right? So when we in America, and today we're all blacks in here, so in America, when we think about where hatred is coming from, it's not just coming from white folks, because there are black people who are hateful. There are people who have forgotten the history and the understanding of what it means to be set free. You know, your mind can be a place of slavery. And I always tell people, your mind is the devil's workplace. It is from the mind that, that when the eyes see something and the eyes want it, and the desires and all the wicked things that is in the heart, suddenly the mind says, you know what? I deserve that. That should be mine. I'm going to go after it. And people will kill. Recently, we saw two weeks ago a major killing in Dade County of a young person. You know, we'll walk the streets and fight against the white man shooting one of us. But we don't march the streets when we are killing our own people in genocide. One thing people don't understand about this thing of slavery, and the reason I'm talking about it is for you to understand why you're free. Sin is a terrible thing because it makes your might becomes your right. It makes you think that what you're doing is right because you have a right to do what you do when you do it. And that's just sin. So you see, we say white people can't kill us, but we can commit genocide on ourselves. And nobody marches for that. Nobody in our culture march against hatred and against when we're selling dopes or in a city and killing our young kids. Nobody marches for freedom to say wrong is just wickedness and we don't care who is doing it. Nobody does that. And we all celebrate all these holidays every time. You know, we're excited for Thanksgiving. We're excited for Christmas. We're excited for the fourth. And we, we fire guns up in the air and we shoot this and we do that. But the real truth about life is the only freedom we should be celebrating is the freedom in God. Yeah. Because when God changes a man, he's truly changed. 
Nobody can change you but God. Nobody. You could get all the money in the world, it's not going to change you. It's just going to give you more opportunities to be more wicked. Because now you have the capital to do what you want to do. You see, we have to learn to celebrate freedom, not just on the fourth. But we should be celebrating because years ago, someone said, I came to die for you and for your sins. And I'm going to set you free from oppressors. I'm going to give you liberty. I'm going to give you peace, even in the midst of storms. I'm going to make your life become a place where I'm going to put my people around you. And together, you guys can achieve. So before I close, anyone today have a testimony that they would like to share about the goodness and of God. And I don't want to hear that you got a house. And I don't want to hear that you got a new job. You know, I always pose a question to people in the congregation, what have you done for God lately? That's the testimony I look for. We all want God to do for us. But what have you done lately for God? In the words of Miss Janet Jackson, what have you done lately? Amen? Good morning, church. Pastor and Mr. Pastor. Today, we're living on God's grace and all of his mercy. And I thanked him this morning just because of his grace and his mercy. I thanked him because the enemy wouldn't even allow a few men to come. I thank him for that. I thank him, like she said, our freedom. It is just not, uh, and, I, and we searched that and we talked about that. When the enemy is walking all around, just like God in the text of prayer, it is easy to discourage you from going for it. But when he touched you, I'm arguing with the gospel in Bible. Well, excuse me, Bible hospital. I'm arguing with them because the federal appeal tells me I have to make this appeal. And I was just going to make that appeal. That's it. This is Bible. Wall Street Hospital. They sent a heart specialist in. take me in to do a colonoscopy because I was bleeding in the inner part. The lower colon, well, the upper colon, well, they don't know what it is. And it's running back. And when the heart surgeon came in, and when he did his test on me, he came back 24 hours later. And they said, how many therapies that you had? And just the heart failure. And I said, well, that's one. But where is that going? Just the heart failure. What you have, whatever medications that they have been putting you on, this is what your problem is. And I'm here to tell you, along with my nurse, the federal government kills you. Yeah, they kill you because they're overcrowded in their prison system. So you are the first to receive the guinea pig medication. and drink water. And when she went back, there was nothing she said. Because she went back to get scheduled for the surgery. But there was no cancer cells. So the enemy had to shut down. And I am very much thankful that God did not shut down the enemy. But she's still here. I call her crazy because they call me crazy. They call him crazy. They call us all crazy. We just crazy. But what God, grace and mercy has done for without his grace and mercy today, we would still be living in the sin and corrupted world that we were living in. And if they call me crazy, because I tell my son back here, Mr. Anthony, stand up, please. Are you going? This is my last Sunday with you. Are you going? He said, Mama, I'll be there. And then Mr. Stand up, Mr. Hayes. We want to introduce y'all to our district here, family. Stand up, Mr. Hayes. And Mr. Hayes put in, and then Mr. Hayes invited his homeboy to came. But then the counselors started shooting every other person down because it was just busy being human at that point in time. Being grateful and thankful today and showing this mysterious hand that you are not more powerful than the man we serve. And his name is Jesus.
So I'm grateful and thankful today for Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, somebody else? Are we transitioning to the word of the Lord? Gentlemen in the back. All right, great. Amen. experienced a freedom uh, this week uh, through his grace we uh, we started our, our this is our first week of family in distress the office being open from nine to five all week long and I run a 24-hour network of my own with radio stations and blogs and promoting and all of that but I committed to three days a week for family in distress. And um, what I found was though that even on the, the two days that I have that God still has need of me as his servant. And I, and I wrestled with that. I even spoke up and I got corrected too and I'm grateful for that. But I spoke up and I was like, you know, I'm already squeezing everything that I have into these two days. I said, uh -uh. And I was just politely reminded you know, God God comes first, and, and I'm not going to lie, sometimes I struggle with that. But when I was obedient to that, I mean, doors just opened up. My, my, my show, my live chat show, Friday night, we had a fashion designer on there, and it brought 300 people to the show, and I've just never experienced that before. And so, God first, y'all. All right. God is first. Yeah. He won't be second. Yeah. <laughs> he definitely won't be third. Amen. Yeah. All right. Let's go to our word this morning. Uh, anybody need, we have Bibles up here. If you need Bibles, we'll pass your Bible. We, we are a word church. Okay. If, if I described or if I said or someone said, hey, this is a word church, what do you think that might mean? What might that mean if this is a word church? Nobody has any idea? I said, what, what might that mean if you heard that this is a word church? Church of the Bible. Okay. All right, somebody else, what, what might that mean? Yes. You're going to come and learn? In other words, we esteem the word of the Lord. It is the, not only is it the priority, but it is the authority in our lives. Okay, it's priority and authority. What happens if it's priority, but you don't allow it to be authority? You're going to have, you're going to have some, some internal conflict, aren't you? you you're going to have some additional wars because now it's one thing to war against one another. But it's another thing to war against God. How many know you never win that war? You can run, you can hide, but wherever you are, there he is, right? You can never go beyond the reach of the Lord. So we allow him 
first to be our priority, but certainly to be our authority. Amen. Amen. So what he says is what we'll do. What he says is what we'll honor. It's the decision that we'll make. That's what it means to be in a word church. So when you see us doing things, if it's not in this, it's not God. Amen. But if it's in the book, then it's something that we certainly should esteem to and you should be supporting wholeheartedly. Amen? Amen. Wholeheartedly. Amen. Last week we talked about, we were we, we did go back and we reviewed the story of the prodigal son. We talked, not prodigal son, I'm sorry, the, the Samaritan. <laughs> the Samaritan. Yeah. And, um, you know, as we looked at that story, we, we saw different things that distinguish each of the persons that that person encountered. Right, we saw uh, a priest, and and although this person is called priest, they're not functioning as a priest, and they're not fulfilling the purpose of a priest. Right, and and that how does that translate to our days? That there are people in position who are out of position in God. They have embraced a responsibility, but they cannot function in that that responsibility fully because they're not in the place that God. have a, uh, our big man for the Miami Heat, we have Whiteside, and we have Bird, right? And, and the reason that they play center is because they're almost seven feet tall. But what would happen if we put Shabazz Napier at center? He'd be out of position. Good player, out of position, little effect, okay? Can be taken advantage of, right? Because he's in the wrong position, right? Doesn't, doesn't minimize doesn't minify the fact that he's on the team. But if he's out of position, it's going to hurt the team overall, right? You can have people in this position. And they're out of position. And ultimately, because they're out of position, they can only give what they have, right? If, they're, if, if that's lack of faith, it's going gonna, it's gonna to emit to the people. If, it's out of, if I'm out of purpose, that's going to emit to the people. So it's important that the people that are in our lives, who are speaking in our lives, are in the right position as God has ordained them to be. You are fulfilling that purpose. So purpose is everything. Okay, purpose is everything. You ever, uh, I, uh, there was a story years ago about three, three ladders on a stage. And uh, all three went beyond the height of the ceiling. But from the view of the people in the audience, no one could tell how high it ascended to except the person who actually climbed the ladder. So the person who had the responsibility to climb the ladder had choices to make. And each ladder was laced with certain things that were appealing to that person so that it was a hard decision to make. You ever had three choices in front of you and all of them seemed like something you might want and because all these things were appealing to you, you it, it just nullified you, it paralyzed you, it stopped you in your tracks. He said, I don't know what to choose. I mean, when we get to that place in our lives, if we have a relationship with God, I mean, he's already chosen for us. Y'all believe that? God is already chosen for us, and he always chooses right. Right? He always chooses right. Where we have chosen wrong, right? So what they did was they said, okay, young man, you can go up there. There's three ladders. You take your chance, and you choose the right ladder. Right? And they had five people in the study. The first person went up there. And he says, man, I just, you know, all right, I'm just going to take A. And he went up, and A didn't go as high as he wanted it to go. So he felt short right? So he came on back down. And then the thing is, there was a clock rolling as well. Because how many know that every step we take is calculated, and there's a time for every purpose in the heaven, right? And sometimes you don't have time to do it all over again. Somebody better listen to me this morning. You have to choose right. Because if you choose wrong, you might run out of time. The man on death row is saying, I need more time so I can fulfill my purpose. But he's out of time, right? The person who chooses incorrectly sometimes don't get the chance to do it all over again. Sometimes they have to battle from where they are, where they've chosen, right? So he said, listen, if you come down and you can't make it up the next one and it's the wrong one, 
then you've wasted your opportunity. And how many know right now in life, there are so many people who have wasted opportunity. Amen. We're at the place as believers where we don't have to, we don't have to choose that path. It's getting out of the way. God said, I put this world in life and I put sin. I put blessings and I put curses. Now choose life. What do we have to do? We take the path that God has already given us. And if we choose that path, it always leads to life and godliness. It always does. It never leads to regret. It never will lead, lead to it leads to reward. It leads to honor. It leads to heaven opening up and saying, I'm pleased with this person. Right? So we need to choose the path that God has for us. So what are the things that often deceive us? This morning we're going to talk about our eyes. <laughs> because our eyes can lead us astray. How many times have you thought you saw a picture until you got up close to it and you realized what you saw from a distance wasn't what you saw when you got up there. Right? So we're going to talk about that. We're going to work on training our eyes to see what God has for us. Okay? To see what God has for us to see. Last week when I talked about sight, uh, as I in, incorporated into our into our, our lesson, we said that sight in God or sight in the kingdom uh, brought to a decision that you can first just to be able to perceive. Can I perceive really happening in this world. And if I can perceive the threat, in the kingdom, he allows me now to know what's in front of me. Okay? To know what's in front of me. And as I know it, and know it, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept. Because when the Bible talks about the word know, um, in its God, knowing God, if you know God, it is more intimate than anything you can imagine in the natural, right? Anything you can experience in the natural, knowing him is the desire of every true believer. We want to know him, right? And as Paul said, I want to know him and the fellowship of his suffering, right? So in, in the kingdom, sight or vision, again, allows us three dimensions. First two perceive. I can perceive this. Next, it's going to allow me to know what I'm seeing instantly, right? And then lastly, it's going to allow me to experience the fullness of what's in front of me. The fullness of what's in front of me, right? What, what, why is this so important? Because without having access to the other dimensions, we make determinations only upon and perception sometimes becomes reality, but if it's false reality, it becomes false for us. Often we allow what we see to become our, our reality, right? What, what, who accepts limitations? Limitations are cast primarily by the things we've seen. And we say, well, if that's the way it's always been, that's how it will always be. That's limitations. That's, that's allowing that which we're perceiving to become reality for us. But if what we're seeing is always false, then we walk around with false reality, false expectations, limitations, and not expecting or experiencing the best of God. Does that make sense? So watch this. Go to 1 John in your Bible. 1 John. So we're looking at those three dimensions. First, I need to accurately perceive. I need to really see what's in front of me. Verse number 15, 16, and 17. Okay, everybody's got it? First John. It's near the back. 
Your revelation. Okay. And here is a command that comes forward in verse 15. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now watch this. The word world in the Greek is the word cosmos. It's where we get cosmopolitan. What it means, is, it means cultures. It means behaviors. It means fads. It means traditions. Okay? It's the system of the world. Don't love the system of the world. Don't love its cultures. <laughs> Don't love its traditions. Right? Don't, don't love its fads. How many know that every fad has come and go? Yeah. I remember some of the some of the clothes I wear. My kids, when they when I was when they were really younger, they just say, "Dad, you dress so old school." <laughs> That's what they used to say to me, right? And now, as they matured, and some of those styles that I've always worn have come back, they're like, "Dad, you you got swag. Dad, you cool, <laughs> right?" But I used to be old school. That they couldn't relate, right? But but fast come and they go. The way people are dressing today, you know, some of these things they're not going to be around. Oh, I'm, I'm going to tell you one. All that that what do they call that? All that sagging. You think that's going to be around 20 years from now, Jake? <laughs> you know, it wasn't around 20 years ago. It was not. People were respectful. People didn't want to be identified as rapists. You know, if the police said, you know, there's 911 car, there's a rapist in the area. Who are you looking for? The man can't even get his pants back up. We already know who he is, right? So no. So those fads, they come and they go. Music comes and it goes. Cultures come and it goes, right? What's popular today may not be popular tomorrow, right? So God is warning us not to allow, not to allow the world and the things in the world to be the greatest influence in your life. Are y'all hearing that? He's saying not allow the world and the influence of the world to be the greatest influence in your life. somebody has a negative experience in one year, should they mean they never invest in real estate again? But how many know that there are some people who are so afraid now that they'll never do it again? Right? So what happened? They allowed their experience to influence them and keep them from experiencing the best that God has for them. Does that make sense? So God is warning us. He says, listen, all the days of your life or something that is inconsistent he says choose my influence over that influence does that make sense so he wants us to choose him first watch what he says here for all that is in the world what are we talking about in our society in our culture in our fads in our traditions in our styles right all of these things are based upon these next three things. Number one, they're based on the lust of the flesh. Okay. Who's always going to be the most popular in every fad? People who are perceived to be pretty. Yeah. People who are perceived to be fit. Yeah. Right? Those yeah. who have the right look. Yeah. Now, those things existed in Bible times as well. Sure and that's why it's written. Right? Because if they're going to choose a leader, who are they going to choose? The one who looks the part. Remember I said last week, people come in, and they might come in with sag, and then you see them as thug. Well, God sees them as thug minister. Okay. Yeah. So we limit based upon the first, the first dimension. But God is trying to train us how to get to the third. 
how to get to the third, right? Watch this. So it said everything in the world, and the reason it changes so much is because it's based on these three things. Number one, the lust of the flesh. How many times has our flesh deceived us? How many times has our flesh, you know, led us into choices that we now regret or have regrets? Right? Our flesh. Right? Our flesh. It, it influences our choices all the time. Right? And then once we have had an experience, we, we open up our senses and then we allow the other images around us to consistently drive our choices rather than allowing the word to show you the real picture. All that's in the world. This is what drives the world. This is what will always drive the world. Okay? It will always drive the world. It's the lust of the flesh. So lust of the flesh, what, what, what is that? So it's not just to yearn for that which is fleshly, but it's also the things that make us feel good in the flesh. What makes us feel good? That's the things that we, we want. Okay? Those are the things that will always be changing in our lives. Those are the things that will always be trying to this is one of the reasons why people can't fast. <laughs> Man, I love food, right? Yeah. Food is good all the time, right? Yeah. But because it's so good and you allow it to be like that to you, you can't even get away from it to control your flesh. You can't say, God, I'm going to depend on you. I remember the first time, and, and this was back in Minneapolis, we said we're going on a 31-day fast. And a 31-day fast was water only. A lot of prayer. A lot of prayer. <laughs> a whole lot of prayer. And a lot of water, right? And uh, I remember the first time we announced that for the body, right? And, and at the time, see, the first time we did it, we had about 400 members at the time. This is what the Lord is saying. We're going 31 days. Now, people that are taking meds, we respect that, right? God's not calling you into it. There's different things you can do while we're fasting. But those that are without, we're going to do this. We're going to believe God and we're going to be stronger. We're going to be better than we were before we went on the fast, right? So what are we doing? Not only is God issuing a challenge, but now people have to build faith to embrace the challenge, right? You've got to have the faith. How, how, how does faith come? hearing and hearing the word of the Lord, right? That's the only way we have faith. So so every time we got together and, and daily we did this thing where people called in in the morning and I had what was called a faith refresher, right? So the faith refresher, you call in the morning, hear Pastor, call, he on the phone, he building your faith. And it wasn't me, it's Dupree. <laughs> and we work in the phone, we try to build in the people. Y'all can do it today, right? God says you can do it. Here's the word of the Lord, right? And do you know, I'm going to tell you, we had a basketball team because we had a gym in, in our facility. And, uh, and we had tournaments lined up that month. That month, we didn't lose a game. We played on water and on faith, right? We won more trophies in that month <laughs> playing basketball. I mean, all the extra weight was gone. We were dependent on the Lord. We slept like babies, right? You slept good, and you just overall felt better. And, and 31 there we, we did like a we did a major testimonial service and people talked about what their experience was like right now watch this because we were successful in doing 31 days don't you know the next fast that we called it was easier for people to do it was less questions that went up the next time no rebuttals we trust the lord why because we did it and we are overcame and we achieved right and and i really believe So we've done those types of things as a church, and why do we do it? Because it's in the Word. If it's not in the Word, guess what? We ain't doing it, <laughs> right? We're not going to do that. We have skinny people in here like Stefan, and he, he'd, be, he'd be concerned. Pastor, 31 days, man? 
You already got me doing 25 push-ups, man. <laughs> you already got me doing push-ups, man. Now, now you're talking about no eating? So the lust of the flesh, it drives the decisions and influences the world. so they can distribute as someone has need. Right. Now watch this. If you're in the world system, are you going to do that? No. Not at all. He's telling us right here. You're going to do what the world does. Right? You're going to 
consistently do what the world does. So if you realize that somebody else on your team just bought their 11th car, what are you going to do, Mr. Dean? I'm going to buy 12. Yeah. It's real, this, this is real talk. That's what they do. That's what they do, right? Man, y'all come on over. Y'all come on over. It's been stories of people who, they went in, they built a house. And then they realized after, you know, they built like a 7,000, 8,000 square foot house. Then somebody else come in the block and build a house a little bit bigger, right? They don't want this house no more. Now they got to build a bigger house, right? So it, it's the quest. It's always keeping you changing, pursuing the things that are in the world. But that's not the nature of God for our life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he tells us, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. they did, we're going to fall into the same traps, aren't we? If there was no Bible to read, we'd be all just trying to figure this thing out. But we have a blueprint. We have a guide. So why not follow it? Right? If you follow it, it gets you where you want to go too quick. It really does. Right? So that's why it had to be written, because there were people in the church who were affluent. There were people in the church But yet, there's people around you with issues. There's people around you going through. And who's going to care for them? You were sent to the earth to be a source of distribution, a resource to the lost and hurt around you. It's part of your purpose. Now, years ago, a lot of us, a lot of us didn't know what our purpose was. I really thought my purpose was I was just going to play football forever. I really did. That's all I wanted to do. Okay? That's all I wanted to do. Other than, I did, I, I will admit this, in ninth grade, I did. As a living, and I went to a, uh, a training camp at University of Saint Thomas. It was a program led by Les Brown. It was called Take the Leap, and it was a one-week camp where they had you had to be sent there, appointed there by your school. You had to be a student, and you had to have recommendation letters. They could only send like two persons per school, right? So I was sent there to this camp, and uh, and while we were there, it's a leadership camp. We were taught about leadership, and we were exposed. You know, represented different industries. And um, so they, they would teach us and they would mentor us and they would train us. And then at the end of the week, they had this big presentation. And it was a dinner, it was a banquet. And all the students had to, at the end of the week, stand up and give a speech about not only what they had learned, but what they wanted to be as they grew up. And as I thought about it, I saw these guys, none of them had passion for what they were doing. They were just kind of talking and they were educated, they were smart. Let folks know. I want to live some with, with some exuberance in my life. So when I got up there to speak, I talked about being a professional speaker. Right? There it is. About being a professional speaker. Because to me, if I was going to live, everything about my life was passionate. Everything about my life, you know, was filled with vibrancy and so on and so forth. And that seemed to be the only one that would allow me to do so. You mean if I study this, I gotta be dry like you? 
<laughs> if I study this field over here, I got to be boring like you. I'll never be that, right? So other than that, you know, I had ideas about what I wanted to be. But I'm letting you know that as I got to know God, he started to reveal to me what my real purpose in life was. And then watch this. When he reveals it to us, he wants you to accept it. But we don't always readily accept it. Some of us idle. Ask Jonah. Right? And, and you don't have to look far for Jonah. Sometimes Jonah be sitting in your church. Sometimes Jonah be sitting in your office. Going through over and over and over. Sad story after sad story, broke after broke after broke, hurting, always wounded, right? Because they've not accepted the purpose that God has for their lives. And then watch this. When you try to help them, sometimes your help is detrimental because you enable them to stay where they are. Because now they don't have to look to God, they look to God. world is passing away and the lust of it so everything you love about the world is changing okay everything you love about it is changing but he who does the will of God abides As you know his love right now, the same love you know now is the same love you're going to always experience. Where everything else in the world is always changing. Okay? If, if there was ever something that we need, guys, we need consistency in our life. And God knew that. And that's why he gives us hot seat. And anytime he gives us covenant, he says, it's a forever covenant. Okay? It's an enduring covenant. I give you agape. I give you love. I give you passionate love. And it never ends. Because we need that. Right? That's what we need. When everything else around us in the world is going to change. People change. Their love, their likes change. Their affections change. Their, their desires change. But yet God endures forever. Okay? So he's trying to tell you, choose God, right? So watch this. So man uses his eyes for his own lust to fulfill his physical cravings. It leads to the pride of life, which we saw it, right? That's the reason why our desires keep changing, so on and so forth. Now watch this. John chapter 3, not 1 John. Let's go to John chapter 3. There it is. I'm going to take you to at least two other areas of Scripture, and then I want to just expound on one thing, and then we'll be done for today. All right, John chapter 3. So how do I, how do I get to experience this to where I'm not influenced by the way of the world, but I'm only influenced by God? Mr. Dean said it well on Wednesday night about some of the things that we're taught. Um, for example, we were talking about baptism on Wednesday night. And how we're born into sin. And because we're born into sin, we only want what sin produces. We chase after sin. We, we become candidates. It's easy to teach us to sin. Okay? And, and not only do we, we learn to sin, but then we want everybody around us to accept that that's who we are. And then when you try to change, people who only know sin have a hard time recognizing you for what you who you are now, right? Because yeah. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, come on, man. We used to yeah. do this together. Yeah, you said it right, used to. <laughs> right? But now I'm changed. Now I'm born again. So so that nature had to change. It, that nature had to die. So the Bible says this is how it dies. Watch this. In John chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. Let I me mean, know to become a ruler of a nation, you have to be educated. Amen. Yeah? To be 
a rule of a nation, right? You you don't rule just by force. You don't you don't rule just because you got the biggest biceps or you're the biggest guy. No, to rule a nation, you got to be educated, right? So this guy Nicodemus is very educated. He knows he knows the law. Okay? He knows the word because he's a Pharisee. He's actually a teacher of the law. Watch this. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. How do we know this? For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Okay? Now watch this. He didn't say, we know you are a teacher come from God because you know the word. He didn't say that. Because with all intents and purposes, he was a teacher of the law. And he knew the word. He knew the logos, the logos, which is the written word. Everybody who studies the written, the logos, he knew the written word. Even Satan knows the written word. And he'll quote it to you. So the teacher of the law, he knew the written word. But he was trying to get to know the living word. Because what he was really saying to Jesus is, Rabbi or teacher, we see, we perceive, and we're starting to know that you are the living word. Because no one can do what you're doing <laughs> except God is with you. Right? Right? And what do people want to see and know now? They want to see people who not just know the Logos, but people who are doing the Logos. Because it takes God to help you do the Logos. You cannot do it except God does it through you. What did he say? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Right? So the man with God will do God things. And people will see it and know that it is God who's getting the work done. So he's saying, listen, what's different between you and I? We both know Logos. But I want to know how you can actually do Logos. How do you do that? How can I... How can I fully know? How can I experience what you're experiencing? For no one can do what you're doing except God is with him. So if he's really saying something, he's saying, I've been working the low God without God. I wear the robe. I'm respected amongst my people. I'm a ruler of the Jews. And I can work the Logos, but I'm working it in myself. I'm not working it with God. And that's what separates Jesus from the Pharisees. What separates us today? Everybody has some familiarity with the Logos. The, the, the Greek word for when it comes alive is a word called rhema. It's the spirit word. Okay? It's the spirit word. When the word becomes spirit, it lives. Jesus says, my words are spirit and life. Your words are logos. <laughs> Your words are just written. My words, that's in John 6, 63. My words are spirit. My words are rhema and life. God breathed, right? The Hebrew of breathe is pneuma. The Greek of breathe is rhema. It's the rhema word. It's the living word. It's the spirit word. Where in the Old Testament, it was the pneuma, the breath of God. The, oh God. He breathed his breath in him and the man became a living being. So Jesus is the spirit word. That's who he is. So how do you go from that which is written to that which is now seen?
seen and experienced. Jesus is going to tell them how to do it. He says, you know, you know the sin nature. But Jesus knew no sin. So the contrast is while we have mastered the sin nature, Jesus mastered the God nature. Because he was fully God, right? His father was God, right? But yet, yet indwelling in, in man, <laughs> right? So while he looks like, to know him is to know beyond what he looks like. So the first dimension is perception. You look like me, Jesus. But nobody could do what you're doing except God. So it's the God nature. It's, it's what is it? What was he trying to find? He knew the world system. And we all grow up. We know the world system. But people who are hurting, people who are yearning for more, are looking for God to be revealed. In what appears to be, what appears to be natural man. Amen. Okay. So when they're seeing, we have to be who they're looking for. And the only way they're going to know, right? The only way they're going to know, watch this, Jesus tells them. Let's read further. Verse number three. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say this to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So you have to be born to the God nature. So what does that mean? Watch this. Everything you were taught in the natural prepared you for life in the natural. There is one thing that prepares you for life in the spirit. It's the Logos. But God breathed on it. It's the rhema. It is the word of the Lord that prepares you for the God nature. Otherwise, you don't know it. Otherwise, you cannot know it. So he's saying, Nicodemus, you know this very well. But you don't know the God nature. You know the system. You got the rules. You got the religion. You got the, you got the look, brother don't know the spirit of the word. So unless a man is born again, he can't see. And what do we say defining? We're defining see? Not only perceive, because he perceived, he, this is rabbi, this I perceive you to be a teacher, right? But there was more he said. No one can do. I want to know how you do what you do. So we go from perception into knowing and lastly, into the experience. And the experience is, we're all doing what Jesus did. Amen. And when Jesus was done with his disciples, he said, don't marvel at what I've done. You're going to do greater works. Amen. Right? He had taken them from just perceiving. He had taken them into the realm of knowing. And lastly, he took them into the realm of experience. Yeah. Okay? He takes them into those three dimensions. And that's what they're using their eyes for. That's what they're using. If, if there was a way, and, and we're going to look at here in Scripture too. You know how our natural eyes, as I said, they can deceive us. And, and sometimes we, we just realize that we're blind to certain things. But the spiritual eyes never, they're never in darkness. They see all things, they know all things. Spiritual eyes. You, you can see stuff that folks can't see. And, and the Bible shows us different times where, where men were, you know, they were afraid. And, uh, and the angels was all around them. And, and everybody was still afraid because they didn't know the resources of heaven that were there. And then the prophet says, God, open up their eyes so they can see what I see. And their eyes were open. And all of a sudden, they saw all the angels yeah. <laughs> around them, right? If God opened up your eyes this morning and you can start seeing heaven's heaven's position here in the earth realm wouldn't it change your life I mean life will take on no meaning it will and see those are the realities God wants to bring us into in the kingdom of God he wants to open up our vision so we can see what he sees so we don't never 
judge only on the first dimension. It's never just about the perception. But can I know and can I experience? That's what he was doing with Nicodemus. So in order for us to have that experience, we must be born again. Okay? We must be born again. We got to have that experience. If we want that, we have to be born again. God, do away with the old nature. Give me a new nature. Right? A lot of it comes with our confession. Father, I confess that I was a sinner, that I am a sinner. However, your grace and your blood paid a price for Now watch this. Here's the other level of deception that happens. Go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And this is why faith is so important in our lives. Do you know the enemy tries to tell us all along how we don't need church, right? Because we don't really need anybody to teach us anything. That's, that's what he tries to convince us of. So it's a battle to try to get people in church sometimes, especially men. Amen. Right? <laughs> come on, man. If you come out by your lunch or something, right? Amen. You got to work a brother to get to church. Mark, you ever visit the barbershop, man, and you talk to these guys? Man, do y'all go to church? Nah, man, I don't go to no church, right? They got every excuse in the book. Every excuse in the book. Because they don't realize, they don't, they don't feel like they need it. It's not necessary, right? That's, the, that's, where, that's where the world has taught us. And, and not only has the world taught us, but people who know the Logos, who aren't experienced in Raymond, have taught us that you know, it don't make no difference in your life. It wasn't making a difference in, in, in Nicodemus' life. And he had to look, right? But yet he saw that Jesus was different. And he wanted to experience what Jesus was experiencing. So therefore, he had to be born again. Okay? He had to be born again. You need him? Okay. All right, there you go. All right. John chapter 20, y'all there? How many of y'all have ever said, unless I see it, I won't believe it? Yeah. Say that? Yeah. Cool fix you say that? Yeah. yeah. Why do we say that? Because we, we lack faith. Why, why else do we say that? Like we say, we've heard it reinforced over and over again that seeing is believing, right? Have we, have we had that reinforced? Yeah. Isha? You preach that? Yeah? When I see it, I believe it. Yeah, but it don't take faith to believe if you already see it. Right? right. Okay, so the seeing to believe, again, is, is it's, um, the opposite order of what God wants in our lives. God wants us to believe, and then we'll see. But the world teaches us, to wait till we see <laughs> and then we believe. Well, the storm is already here. Now, now I'm at the mercy of somebody to come and rescue me. <laughs> so it's a setup. That system is a setup, right? So it's the sin to believe. It, it makes you ill-prepared to respond to makes you ill prepared what's in front of you. Seeing to believe makes you ill prepared for what's in front of you. Because sometimes it's too late. Okay? Sometimes you can't respond because it's too late. It's on you now. What do I do now? Right? Because I'm seeing to believe. God wants you to believe in order to see. 
I was talking to a group of guys, matter of fact, at the mission, and, and one of the guys says he had got the job, he used to work on the assembly line. I said, great, you'll, you'll be able to help me with this illustration. So how does it work on the assembly line for the car? He says, well, you know, they put the body and the chassis comes, and then <laughs> that, that conveyor belt just rolls it down at every stage. You know, it's a machinery, or you got people ready to put a new part on the car. And I said, so what happens if somebody skips a part? He says, man, instant break, breakdown, instant failure. This is a matter, of, I mean, before, you can't even get, some, some of the parts are arranged so in order that if you miss a stage, by the time it goes to the next one, the next part won't fit. Because everything is ordered. Okay, and when things are ordered, you have to follow the order. It leads to peace. Don't you have peace when stuff's orderly? Like if somebody says, um, there's a file on your desk, it's, it's page number four. If you know that's where it is, and then you don't have no stress, because all you know, you're going to open up the file, and you get, and it's going to be right there, right? But if there's no arrangement, and, and you got deadlines, it adds to stress in your life, right? So the disorder leads to stress in our lives. So when we say we get out of order with the world's way of believing versus God's way, it leads to situations to well I'm ill prepared. Okay? Well, I'll be ill prepared to deal with what's in front of me. Watch this. In John chapter 20, I'm going to start at verse number 19. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for the fear of the Jews. So we stop right there. We see here Jesus has died. Um, there's reports that he's resurrected. The Jews are trying to look for the disciples. They want to stop them to make sure they don't tell any stories about this resurrected Christ. So they're fearing for their lives, and they're locked in a place in a hidden place, okay? So the doors are locked, and we know that because this is what the Bible Yeah, 
hindered by locked doors. He won't be hindered by fear. He's going to make himself seen. He shows up. Now, why do we believe that? There are accounts in, in our times of people in the physical showing up to help us in our greatest time of need. And then all of a sudden, when you, when you, when you get your eyes off of them and then you look back, they're gone. And we say, you know, the angels showed up. But how many know that Christ is a high angel? <laughs> right? So if we know angels have that ability, how much more does Christ? So he, he, he's not confined to walls. He's not confined to boundaries and borders. He shows up where he's most needed. And in that time, they really needed the Lord. Because he was counseling, right? So watch this. Watch, watch how that the world tries to work its way into the church. It says, Jesus came, stood in the midst, and said to them, peace be still. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, right? So the first, the first dimension is to perceive this is Jesus in the midst. But then how am I going to know him? He shows him his hands and his side, right? Because they remember his flesh being battered. They remember his flesh being torn, right? And in some accounts that he was so disfigured, you couldn't even recognize him. But you recognize what he did. You recognize that they pierced his side. They recognize that they, they pierced his hands, right? So here he is in the midst. They perceive it's Jesus. How do I know it's him? How do we know it's really you? Right? He had the marks. He had the scars to show them so they might know. First is perceive. Second is to know. I know for sure you're the one. I know for sure for certain that that. So the word came alive. Logos got to come alive in your life. It can't just be what God said. It's got to be seen in you. It's got to be done through you, right? The word has to come alive. People will say, yeah, I know the word. I know the word. But the word is dead in them. You got to let the word come alive. So he said, guys, I've given you the word. Now I'm giving you the spirit of the word so you can do what the word has said. See the Holy Spirit. Then he says in verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, okay, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What, what an assignment. What, what you're going to be able to help people get free? Absolutely. Or if you don't, if you don't address that issue, they're going to retain their sin. But Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and I put my finger in the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So watch this. He is, why is he doubting? Because he wasn't with. He was not with. So watch 
got this. There is a value for being with the right people. There, there, there is, I'm telling you guys, you don't know the value until your test comes. So, so Thomas was, was cool because he was associated with the 12, right? But here he's separated. And while he's separated, the test comes, and his confession is, I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to believe it till I see it. Who's he sound like he's been with? The world, right? See, watch this. The more I hang with the world, the worse my witness becomes. The more tests I'm going to fail in my life by my associations. If I hang with them, the Bible says don't be deceived. Bad character will corrupt good character, right? So bad company will corrupt good character. That's what it says. that and we ask that the Lord arrange things properly in his mind so he can actually activate you know the word so so Thomas why why did he have that confession it's pretty clear right because he was hanging with the wrong group do you know every time you're out of position your testimony changes your witness changes and, and it's subtle you don't you don't see it until the test comes I'm telling you, it's so subtle, and all of a sudden the test will come, you'll be like, I wasn't with him. I promise you, I don't know the man. Peter, why? Peter, we saw you. I wasn't with him. Every time, I'm telling you, when you get out of position, you get out of the place where God has appointed you, where God has planted you, your confession changes. Yes. And it's so subtle, you don't even recognize it until it come out of your mouth. It comes out of your mouth, and you start saying stuff that, you know, it, it loses. It, it identifies that you're out of position, but it, it minimizes the price and the work he's done in your life. Okay? He says, unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and I can put my finger okay, in his side, I will not believe. And then watch this, verse number 26. And after eight days, right? God is consistent above all things. And we know the first time, what did he do? He showed him his hand. Showed him his side, right? What was Thomas asking for? He says, if I can do the same thing, right, then I'll believe. Right? But now had he been in the right place eight days later, he would have had the faith to not have that confession. Because <laughs> Jesus came to show him. Him and all of them, Right? But because he was out of position, now it's like it's just for him. Or at least that's the way it's perceived. Let's read further. He said, peace to you. Did he say peace the first time? Absolutely, right? Then he said to Thomas, So he gave him the same experience, but then he ended it with a rebuke. His rebuke was, believers are believing. They believe. That's what, separate, that's what makes them believers. They believe first. Don't be unbelieving. As a Christian, always believe. Always believe the best. Always believe that God is able. Always believe God's going to show up. As a Christian, 
That's what we believe, right? Well, the world's way is to not believe. And then if it shows up, then they'll believe, <laughs> right? So our nature is, is, is opposite. It's the antithesis of what we've experienced. It's the exact opposite. We believe. We believe. One, one of the greatest things that can be said about a person as they're, they're eulogized or as they're, you know, people are talking about them in the aftermath of their life to be called a believer. And when people hear it, they know that's just not normal belief. They know that there's something about this person that was different than everybody else. But to be called a believer. And when people say, this person believed with me for this, and, and this person believed that, it, 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 it speaks you know, to the, eternity, to, to the eternity, eternity of time. It speaks to the echoes of time. It goes on when people are known in that way. So Jesus said this, watch this. He said, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And then Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. So you were out of order, right? Yeah. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Amen. See that? Amen. So if someone says, this is how you qualify for blessing. You can believe, although you've not seen. Or you can, <laughs> or you can wait to see to be believe, to, to be believing, right? And he says, if you want to be blessed, and there's two lines, you got to get in the believe line. Because the believers will see. That one over there, you're, you're waiting. And you're still waiting. <laughs> and you're still waiting. And when, when it shows up, as I said, you're ill prepared to deal with the reality that's in front of you. Okay? That's, that's the word of the Lord. Okay? Three things about Jesus that we are, we're going to conclude with as we, next week we're going to talk about I give sight to the blind. We're still dealing with these eyes thing, right? John chapter 9. But I want you to know, based upon what we read today, uh, Jesus never lets, he never allows locked doors, okay? He never allows locked doors and confessions of unbelief yeah. to stop him, okay? He never allows locked doors and confessions of unbelief to stop him, okay? We also know he wants us to know what, what was the message he gave to them each time he came. Peace. He wants you to have his peace. Okay? Have his peace. Don't be worried about all this other stuff. Now have the peace of the Lord. That peace is a stabilizing force. It keeps you balanced in this world. I, I like to look at it like this as I, as I study this and God reveals it to me. It's almost like, you know, you're, you're hanging in the balance and you got the world's ways and you got the kingdom over here that he wants you to know. And it's his peace that stabilizes you. Okay? It keeps you stable while you're choosing, while you're reading every single day. It's his peace that keeps you. It's a stabilizing force in our lives. One of, one of the most difficult things to take away from a man who truly has peace is his because all other stuff, they'll say, you can have that.
experience. He says, now I send you out. Like the Father sent me, I'm sending you. I intend for you to affect you, and I'm looking for you to set captives free. I'm looking for you to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I'm looking for you to preach the word and lives get changed. I'm looking for that. That's the experience I purpose for you. Okay? That's what I played, that's what I made you for. We have to surrender. Okay, we got enough evidence. <laughs> People used to say, ah, you know.
body staying connected and saying, brother, you got to be in church this week. Yeah. Why? Man, Jesus came and saw us. Man, I don't believe that. I can't forget about And then because he came, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus ministered to them. Okay? So so there's an order to that, that, that sometimes Jesus' primary ministry was to his 12. Now, we see where he would minister to 5,000 people and 3,000 people, but his whole purpose and function was, I got 12, and I'm building these 12 who in turn are going to reach 72, who in turn are going to reach the multitude. And that's, that's how you do effective ministry. Okay, but if you're part of the 12, you got to be here. You understand that? Yes. Miss Cummings, you were going to say?
I'm going to I'm going to ask if the choir would help me. All right. Uh, if we would. The song. Tragedies are are so commonplace.